opening keynote for the Global Learning for an Open World Conference. We're so excited to have you here. And we're even more thrilled to have Dana Morrison, who is the CEO and co-founder of World Savvy with us today. Dana is a longtime friend um, of the conference. We've planned many events together and spent time uh, hanging out at other conferences. And uh, I think the world of Dana and, and the work that they're doing at World Savvy to impact schools. So you're gonna learn a lot more from her today. And I just wanna get through some conference logistics uh, before I turn it over to Dana. The first thing that we wanna do is thank our partners, including World Savvy, who is our premier partner. Yay, World Savvy. And Egg and Educational Collaborators and Global Nomads and Empatico and CFR for Education and Taking It Global and GEBG and CILC and Fulbright and uh, Digital Promise in their Sienna Solutions Challenge and My Hero. We are, you are our heroes. And thank you for making this event uh, possible for everyone today. We really want our participants to stop by their expo booths and meet everyone. Uh, certain people will be live at certain times. Otherwise, they'll be responding asynchronously when it's convenient. Um, but you can partake in their, uh, their videos and that sort of thing and learn more about these organizations that have so much to offer uh, GLOW attendees. So please um, thank our, you know, make sure our partners know that, you're, that we're thinking of them and we appreciate their work. Uh, next slide. Uh, today, we hope that you will share out uh, your information with uh, the world and our hashtags are GLOWEDU and GlobalEd22. Uh, next slide, I think was the recording one. Everything is being recorded, uh, just so you know, and the session recordings will be available after, um, after the session closes, as soon as we can publish it to the replay section of Hop In. So don't worry if you weren't able to watch this, the whole entire thing. Uh, we will have it for you as soon as we can, and you can watch the entire thing. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dana because I want to hear everything that she has to say. And thank you, Dana, for being here and for making this conference happen. We really appreciate it. Of course, Lucy, it is such a privilege. Um, I'm very excited to be part of the inaugural GLOW um, uh, conference and to be a partner and a sponsor and, and to have a chance to talk to you all this morning. I know we've got individuals and educators from across the globe that are um, chiming in to learn together this weekend. So very excited to be kicking off with you. Um, I'd like to just start with a little bit of context about World Savvy and my own work in this field. I'm coming into my 21st year of leadership at World Savvy. And this is actually a picture of myself and my co-founder, Madiha Murshed. And Madia and I met um, in graduate school in New York City ages ago um, in 2000 and became really fast friends. Um, Madia uh, is from Bangladesh and she grew up throughout the Mideast and really just had this effortlessly global worldview that I so envied and was so drawn to. Um, and we became close friends and, and studied together and were in classes together. And in the second year of graduate school, 9-11 happened. And I'm from New Jersey um, and was you know born and raised in that area. and um, lost friends in that incident, but also in the aftermath of 9-11 watched, although there were a lot of great things in the community that were bringing people together, there were also, um, there was quite a, a, a terrible xenophobic backlash and a lot of fear um, and misunderstanding. And so that year, Madiha and I really came together to think about how our K-12 system really prepares young people to be ready for, for the world, <clears throat> given how much more diverse and interconnected and complex it is. Um, and from there, World Savvy was born about a year later. And what Medea and I thought about then, and really we think about every day at World Savvy, when we think about reimagining K-12 for the future, is what are the things about the world that we're preparing young people for? How is the world um, going to be changing? And how then does education need to evolve to be able to help young people thrive in those environments? Um, I'll say for our global audience that a lot of what I'm sharing today is US-based in terms of the statistics, um, predominantly because that's the context in which we work. But many of these themes I know um, for colleagues and friends across the globe are still very resonant with respect to what you manage um, in your own educational environments. Um, so the things that well, Medea and I thought about then and that we think about every day, the first is really um, who we are. So in the United States, um, demographically, we have changed um, so much um, from the time that I was born. 
So in the most recent census, which was in 2020, one in seven people marked some other race on the U.S. census. Um, that category didn't even exist um, in the 70s when I was born. Now, nearly three in 10 Asian, one in four Latino, and one in five Black newlyweds are married to a member of a different ethnic or racial group. So we're not just talking about diversity in an abstract sense. Um, we are talking about this being embedded in our closest, most intimate, and personal relationships in our families. For those of you across the globe who might be tennis fans, um, Emma Raducanu is a professional tennis player, and she's sort of emblematic of this diverse identities that um, are so much more difficult now to compartmentalize um, as the world becomes um, more interconnected. Um, her father is Romanian and she speaks fluent Romanian, but she's never lived there. But the Romanian people like to sort of claim her victories as their own and feel a sense of real national pride about Emma's victories. Her mother is Chinese and Emma speaks fluent Mandarin, but again, wasn't born there and doesn't I didn't grow up there, but the Chinese people feel um, quite a bit of ownership over Emma's, of Emma's victories and how well she does. Emma was born in Canada, um, but she lived mostly in the UK and has trained there and competed there. So both Canadians and Britons feel a sense of connection and pride um, tied to Emma's victory. Her identity, this diverse and fluid identity, racial and ethnic and cultural, is more emblematic of what we find are in our communities now than ever before and in our classrooms. So this is a look at the US data here in the United States. The white population declined for the first time since 1790. Um, so this is a report from the Brookings Institute that kind of shows you what that looks like. Um, Latino and Hispanic Americans represented half of the last decade's population gain. And you can see what that looks like here. And again, a decline in the white population. More than 40% of Americans now identify as black, indigenous, or people of color. Um, and you can see how this breaks down um, over the years. So we have, be, be, we have been becoming a more diverse and integrated society um, for quite some time. And it's estimated that by 2045, we will be a collective majority with no single racial group, um, a dominant majority. What this also means is that right now over half of young people identify as black, indigenous, or people of color. And so that means in classrooms across the United States, we have a much more diverse group of learners. And so what is relevant to what is relevant and what really leverages that diversity as an asset needs to also evolve and change. This is just taking New York, um, a state probably most folks around the world will be familiar with at a glance. Um, this is the population of that state overall broken down by the 2020 census um, uh, indication of race. So you can see that it is already a collective majority in the state. But what's interesting about that is that every racial and ethnic group other than white and black experience population growth. And it's not just sort of that 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 diversity was being experienced by communities across the state, it's it's really looking at, it's not just in cities. Um, this is something that's happening in small towns and villages, as you see on the data on this slide. So you can take a look here. If you look down within villages, this, this takes New York City out of the data. There was a 194% increase um, in for individuals that identify as some other race on the U.S. Census in New York. This is a dramatic, dramatic shift. Um, and again, what it means is those diverse identities are the learners in our classrooms and the members of community who are shaping a more multi-ethnic um, community experience and needs to, needs to inform how we change education. So by, again, by 2045, the expectation is that we will be a collective majority and that young people are the engine of that diverse future growth. I mentioned this in the context of New York, but if you look across our country in the United States, it isn't just the Texas, California, New York, sort of usual suspects of where you anticipate more diverse populations growing. Um, this is a look at county level change in diversity since the year 2000. I am in Minnesota currently, top, middle, almost all yellow. Yellow on this map indicates the lowest prior diversity with the biggest increase of diversity since uh, 2000. For those of you who have been to Minnesota or might be familiar with it, we have one of the largest populations of Somali community members in the diaspora here in the US. So um, this, is, this is new in the last 20 years and again, is changing um, who the learners are in our classrooms. 
66 million or 21% of US residents um, speak a language other than English at home. That's 25% of public school students in the US. Um, so again, this change has to impact how we think about relevant learning and instruction in classrooms. The second thing that we think a lot about at World Savvy is to the degree that uh, K-12 school, K-12 environments are designed to help people pre prepare for work, for to get ready to have gainful employment, we think about how the workforce is changing. And the reality is right now is that our world is changing faster than any time in human history. It's the pace of that change. So if you think um, in 2021, 5.4 billion Google searches per day took place. Growing up, um, if any, if anyone else in this call used the Dewey Decimal System, then you'd know that um, the the idea that we'd have access to that much information, um, to be able to to learn at that pace and access that much data, is would be mind blowing. Um, and so this is what young people learning in this environment and preparing for a workforce are distilling every day. Those of you familiar with Buckminster Fuller's knowledge doubling curve have probably heard that it was estimated in 1900 that human knowledge doubled every 100 years. And by 1945, it had increased to doubling every 25 years. That by 2014, it was doubling every 13 months. And in 2020, it was doubling every 12 hours. Again, so it's not just that the world is changing, it's that it's changing at an exponentially greater pace than before. And so how we think about getting young people ready for the workforce and frankly learning in classrooms has to pivot in an extraordinary way. It means that workforce readiness is a bit of a moving target. Um, so with the World Economic Forum three years ago, they estimated that 85% of today's grade schoolers will hold jobs that don't exist yet. My third and fifth grade daughters are more than likely to have a job I've never heard of. Some of the disruptors we already know about are things like driverless cars and flying drones and 3D printing and big data and AI and mass energy storage and robots. And some of the jobs we're already aware of are things like vertical farming and atmospheric water harvesting and drone traffic optimization, crowdfunding and AI. So we're going to hear from some experts on what the implication of this is for workforce readiness. Because we're essentially preparing young people to live in a more diverse world, to do jobs that don't exist yet, to solve problems we don't even know are problems. So as an educator in this room with me this morning, imagine what the implication is, that that technical knowledge or the content that you're trying to impart in a learning environment is not as important as the competencies and the ability you're giving young people to enter into workforce that's going to require unlearning and relearning and upskilling and changing over time. So here are a few experts sharing their perspective. My belief is in the next 10 to 15 years, there's likely to be a net loss of jobs. That is because the speed at which routine jobs are being displaced will be faster than the speed at which new jobs will be created. Tasks that are repetitive in nature, that don't require deep thoughts, strategic creative thinking, those are the jobs that are uh, most in danger. And on the other hand, if we look at the longer term, maybe 20 to 30 years, that doesn't account for the many jobs that will be invented and created. But it's unfortunate that we can't quite predict what those jobs are. Just like if we went back to 1995 and asked me what jobs would be created by the internet, there's no way I would have listed Uber driver. So how do workers future-proof themselves for jobs that don't yet exist? We don't know what the specific new jobs are going to be, but I think we do know the kinds of skills that people are going to need. And some of those are soft skills in terms of knowing how to work with other people, in terms of knowing how to learn to do new things. And some of them are harder skills, whether that's in a particular industry, with a particular technology. What's going to happen when we have even more technology? And when the new technology displaces even more people? There are these narratives out there 
If I just get a little bit more education, I'm going to do better. And that's been the mantra for people all the way along. If you just get a little bit more education, there's a lot of people that have master's degrees that are now working in fulfillment centers and working in part-time jobs. Future-proofing is really what education was always supposed to be, right? It was supposed to provide you with the ability to be flexible, in essence, being employable. The number one reason consistently for enrolling in post-secondary education is to get a good job. But when you actually talk to college graduates, they are consistently telling us that they don't actually feel prepared for the, for the labor market. So what we know is that even those who are continuing through college and entering into the workforce don't often have the skills that are the most sought after. Um, and the Future of Jobs report, would come, which comes out each fall, um, they identify the top workforce skills that employers the world over um, are saying are the most important. And here's what came from the last study. Critical thinking, analysis, complex problem solving, active learning. These are things that in a learning environment that provides only rote memorization and not the opportunity to create environments where students can really grapple with complex issues and build those skills, um, they'll end up unprepared. Things like comfort with change and ambiguity rise to the top of the kind of competencies that young learners are going to need to navigate that workforce. The ability to work in teams and collaborate and think creatively about entrenched problems. In a recent survey of 900 executives, 92% that soft, said that soft skills were equally or more important than technical knowledge for the reasons that we've chatted about. That technical knowledge changes so fast. It's the ability for young people to navigate that change and learn and relearn and unlearn. But a full 89% said they have a very or somewhat difficult time finding employees with those skills. I broke my own rule um, by sharing this in a framing of soft skills. And if there's one thing that you leave um, this conference with, I want to encourage everyone here to stop saying soft skills to the degree you have used them. Unless it's a kitten or a fuzzy blanket, um, soft does not convey the urgency of what we're talking about when we're talking about this kind of these kinds of competencies. Um, and so um, I've been working to brainstorm and folks might pop in the chat other ways to frame these critical kinds of skills for thriving um, in the world. Um, some people say power skills or essential skills. Um, I definitely invite ideas from the group um, globally. The other piece about workforce development that we think quite a bit about is that young people are not just graduating out into the world to find jobs, but they will be shaping the future of the workforce. And that comes with real responsibility. And I'll isolate just one element of how to think about that um, um, in, in artificial intelligence. So algorithms rule our lives. You know, it's the reason that Instagram knows what to sell us um, or that, you know, it, almost everything we do is um, is someone has collected that information and can share more about us than sometimes we even know. Uh, but at the same time, those algorithms are created by humans and the data is input by humans. And so the, the same biases that exist in human beings can be amplified um, and accelerated um, by algorithms if left unchecked. I want to give just a couple of examples. Um, Amazon created a hiring tool a few years ago in 2018, and within 24 hours, it immediately started discriminating against women based on how the algorithm was designed and the tags it was using to identify candidates. So they had to take it down um, and investigate it. Um, and there are many, many instances where algorithms can have a much more dangerous impact on things like housing, criminal justice. Um, and so you know, one example is um, ProPublica did a report a few years ago about an algorithm called Compass that's used in sentencing in the United States criminal justice system quite often. And it tries to predict the likelihood of reoffense or recidivism um, for um, defendants to guide sentencing um, in courts. And ProPublica found that, uh, that essentially Compass was claiming that black defendants posed a higher risk the, of recidivism than white defendants, and the data was flawed. Um, it was not true. So these things have real impact on real lives. Um, they're also used for um, policing different areas. And 
right now what we know is that one in two individuals, at least in this country of American adults, is in a database used by law enforcement um, in an algorithm. Our images um, are in there. So again, when you think about how are we keeping track of and raising a generation of young learners that are going into a field to design these algorithms and design the jobs that depend on them, there is an ethical and moral grounding to consider as well. Um, because these biases will only reinforce themselves and become less clear over time. Um, they're not a transparent process. Facebook is a great um, example of another inundation of information for young people and the, the need to distill it. Right now, or last year, 2021, there were 2.85 active users on Facebook. If you were one of the, the very first in 2008, you're probably one of 100. So that is a significant portion of the planet. Um, who are actively engaging in that space and where many, many, a large percentage of individuals get their news and information. And here in the United States, I'm sure um, across the globe, this is not new news. Um, uh, we had a, a, a contentious 2020 election and misinformation on Facebook was shared six times more often than factual news uh, between the period August uh, August 2020 to January 2021. So, and we all know where we landed. We had an insurrection here um, in the US. So again, as we're thinking about graduating learners who can shape the kinds of technologies and the kinds of jobs um, that will lead us into the future, there's a different kind of consciousness and preparation that is, um, is really important to safeguard democracy too. The third thing that we think so much about is how connected our challenges are in the world. And, you know, I know that we have people coming from dozens of countries this morning and joining this learning opportunity. I think it's a great example. We have certainly lived through uh, the last couple of years, COVID, a prime example of how the world is connected in so many of these ways. And, and so many of the things we face are borderless. They have global cause um, and global consequence. And the example I want to give, I don't know if we have anyone from Bangladesh. Um, it's where Madiha, my co-founder, is from. I've been there several times. Um, and you know, maybe if you're if you're based in Bangladesh or from Bangladesh, you can put that in the chat. But for those less familiar, Bangladesh is a, a country in South Asia. Um, it has a population of over 165 million people, so essentially half that of the United States. But it's about the size of Iowa if you're U.S. based. So at the same time, Bangladesh, it's it's. It is um, predicted that because of climate change and rising sea levels, that up to 50 million people could be displaced in Bangladesh by 2050. So again, Bangladesh did not cl cause climate change, but is feeling the most acute impacts of climate change um, where they are. So just for a moment, I would love for you to imagine in the United States, if we essentially put one half of the country um, into Iowa and then flooded a third of it with nowhere for individuals to go. So these are the, this is the kind of gravity of global issues that um, the next generation needs to be able to confront creatively and collaboratively across borders. Here in the US, US if Bangladesh feels uh, too far away, if you're based here, by 2060, 162 million people, so one in two, will experience a decline in the quality of their environment, hotter and less water. We have already seen this come to fruition the last several years, but by 27, 2070, 28 million people across the country would face Manhattan-sized megafires in Northern California. They could become an annual event. And 13 million people will be forced to, make, away, to move away from submerged coastlines. Um, we, we see this in the US frequently and around the world, um, typhoons and cyclones um, that are uh, creating real issues with flooding and, and coastline damage. So, at World Savvy, we think about this as the underpinning and the foundation for a way to think about what the future of education should be and what could look like. Who are we and who are we as communities and as a global community and who are the learners in our classroom um, and how much more diverse and interconnected um, we are. Um, the second is getting individuals coming out of school ready for jobs. What will they be? How will they create them? And the third is to be ready as change makers and problem solvers so that they can actually address these borderless challenges um, with the right tools and capacity and dispositions. Here in the United States, um, unfortunately, um, in the last year, when we should be in the face of that broadening and extending 
worldviews um, to prepare young people for that complexity, we've we've had um, a sweeping wave of the opposite of narrowing perspectives that can get into classrooms. So um, last year, um, more than 1,579 books, this number has actually climbed and probably climbs daily, were threatened with a ban in the United States. Um, that's more than any of the 20 years prior. Um, 36 states have adopted or introduced laws or policies that restrict teaching about race and racism. And state lawmakers have proposed a record 238 bills so far this year that would limit the rights of LGBTQ Americans. So again, at a time when young people need to broaden and extend a worldview, there are some forces at work that are working to narrow what young people have access to, to distill and grapple with. So at World Savvy, we think a lot about what the future of learning should look like, and then we support schools and districts to create those environments. Um, students, educators, and school leaders in partnership with families and caregivers and the community. And the way we define that is global competence, um, the capacity and disposition to understand and act on issues of global significance. And we've asterisked this, or I have recently, because issues of global significance are really in our backyard. Um, again, we've all experienced a global health pandemic um, that touched every corner of the globe in different ways. And so these aren't issues that can be isolated to only one one part of the world, there are ripple effects and um, and influences that impact everyone. The way we think about global competence, rather than isolating knowledge as a domain, because again, this audience is an incredible illustration of how contextual the importance of knowledge is. If you are in South Asia right now, or you're in Latin America, the 10 most important pieces of knowledge might be very different to you um, than it might be to me sitting here in Minnesota. And so instead, World Savvy embarked on a process to, to essentially say, what are the things, the assumptions about the world that we know to be true that we'll continually come back and lean on as we think about um, uh, confronting, absorbing, distilling, and taking action on new information. And those are that world events and global issues are complex and interdependent, that our own culture and history is key to understanding our relationship with others, that multiple things, multiple conditions fundamentally affect diverse outcomes, and that history matters, that the current world system is shaped by those historical forces. So we look at these four core concepts as we're thinking about embedding global competence into teaching and learning as, a, as an anchoring assumption about the world. When we zoom in and take a look at the kinds of values and attitudes um, that are part of being a globally competent individual, it includes this openness to new opportunities, ideas, and ways of thinking, a real desire to engage with others, a self-awareness about identity and culture and sensitivity and respect for difference and truly valuing multiple perspectives in the service of making good decisions and understanding the world. Reflecting on the context and the meaning of our lives in relationship to something bigger than ourselves, the ability to question prevailing assumptions, adaptability, and empathy. And at World Savvy, when we look at the skills that encompass global competence, we think about the ability to recognize, articulate, and apply an understanding of a different perspective besides our own, using appropriate tools to communicate. Uh, this is also includes multilingualism. How can we expand the way we're communicating with one another? Um, listening actively and engaging in inclusive dialogue. A fluency in the 21st century digital technologies that allow us to connect and problem solve and, and tackle some pretty big challenges together demonstrating resiliency in new situations and applying critical creative thinking. And then finally, we think about the behaviors. So how, what does it look like to show up in the world um, when you've built these values, attitudes, and skills that you're seeking out and applying an understanding of different perspectives to problem solving and decision making, forming opinions based on exploration and evidence, committing to a process of continuous learning, adopting shared responsibility and taking cooperative action, sharing knowledge and discourse, and approaching thinking and problem solving collaboratively. It's worthwhile to note, um, we've worked with this global competence matrix as a way of helping to embed uh, you know, global competence into learning environments for 21 years. And I still maintain that expertise in global competence should really be with a little E, not a capital E. 
Um, this is an aspirational journey um, that we are constantly learning and bumping up against things that should um, help shape and adapt our worldview as the world changes and as we encounter and interact with new people and cultures. So I'm gonna share a video. Um, many of you are probably aware of uh, PISA. Um, it is the largest and biggest um, test across the world um, administered by the OECD every few years um, to understand educational attainment among 15 year olds. Um, and so you may or may not be familiar with the data that comes out that ranks those countries. Um, but what that test, what the OECD decided to do um, in 2018 was to develop a set of indicators that might measure global confidence. So here's a little bit more about that. We live in an interconnected world. Kita hidup di dunia yang saling berhubungan. Nosotros vivimos en un mundo interconectado. Urinen so yongjeolden sawae salgo isseyo. Vivimos en un mundo interconectado. Nous vivons dans un monde interconnecté. These days, education is no longer just about teaching people something, but about helping them develop a reliable compass and the tools to navigate with confidence through a world that is increasingly complex, increasingly volatile, increasingly uncertain. Success in education is about identity. It's about agency. It's about purpose. It's about building curiosity, opening minds. It's about compassion, opening hearts. And it's about courage, mobilizing our cognitive, social and emotional resources to take action. Right now we have a lot of issues and we are acknowledging a lot of problems like global pandemic, the climate crisis and climate change, racial discrimination, the climate crisis, you know, the more interdependent the world becomes, the more we rely on great collaborators and orchestrators, people who can think for themselves, but also who are able to join others and other cultures in work and life and citizenship. With the rise of like social media and you're exposed to different cultures and different um, issues worldwide, and you see that um, other countries are also suffering from the same issues. They feel that it's really important that we feel that, okay, we might be different, we might speak different languages and have different cultures, but in the end, we can all, we can all connect to each other. We need to come to like, conclusive ideas and we need to work together. And having a generation of students who are more interconnected is going to be the most efficient way we can do that. In 2018, the OECD Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, conducted the first assessment of students' capacity to live in an interconnected world. To do well on this assessment, PISA expects that students can combine knowledge about the world with critical reason. If you drink a cup of coffee here in Paris, can you see the connections with workers on a coffee plantation? at the other end of the world. Second, PISA looks at whether students understand and appreciate their perspectives and worldviews of others. And third, PISA looks at whether students can adapt their behavior and communication to interact with individuals from different traditions, different cultures. I just hope we build a better world where everybody can thrive and where nobody is left behind. I hope in 20 years that we'll have a more globally competent and a more understanding generation. My generation is acknowledging the problem. It's not just looking to the other way. They are acknowledging and now we have to keep walking, make a step, a big step and start to help the community, start to help the world, start to help start to start to have solutions for every problem that we have right now. So let's join forces to better support globally competent students. And with that I mean students who will engage to improve the living conditions in their own communities, build a more just, more peaceful, more inclusive, a more sustainable world. So for those of you who have not gone through that data from 2018, um, 
I strongly recommend you take a look at it um, for folks across the world. It's incredibly fascinating to see how young learners um, interacted with that. The U.S. did not take um, the global comp the, the global competence PISA test that year, so you won't find data about the U.S. Um, but it was fascinating and truly some of the data really unsurprising to the educators in this room and the school leaders who who you know might assume that this was the case that, that for those students who had coverage of global issues in the curriculum it was positively associated with related student dispositions right and so this this is a uh, again an unsurprising learning and, and this other piece as well was that when students were engaged in a larger number of these kinds of learning activities around global competence, they had more positive attitudes and dispositions to other people, people and cultures than students who had less of those activities. Again, um, in some ways relatively obvious, right? But could, I can't underscore this enough at a time when we're experiencing in, in the US um, uh, more division and polarization than we have in, in quite some time as we really struggle to become um, the multi-ethnic democracy um, that we are. So I want to share in the last bit of time we have together um, from 21 years now of effective principles from innovative schools that World Savvy has worked with. We've worked across 45 states in the U.S. and 32 countries. Um, we've worked with uh, more than 800,000 students and 7,000 educators across 1,300 schools. So um, there's, we've learned a lot um, from people who do this well and, and what's happening when it's working well for them. And so I want to take first a look at the student experience, which people talk a lot about voice and choice, but we really work to help schools create student-centered environments where they can create a connection to learning about things that they care about and that their own identities can be leveraged in that process. That there's actual opportunity to develop comfort with ambiguity and failure. It's not something generally that K-12 systems are designed to do, right? Encourage failure, but failing forward is an important critical competency and skill if you're trying to build the habits of a change maker mindset. Engaging in that self-directed learning, connecting across content areas, we have an incredibly siloed way of providing instruction. And for this material to come to life, young people and learners need to be able to see how it interacts. Exploring the global context of even personal and local issues at every opportunity, and then opportunities to demonstrate empathy, self-awareness, and humility. So I'm going to share, and of course, what we're doing here today, learning about and with the world. Um, uh, so I grew up in a K-12 experience that was much more food flag festival and fashion that exoticized a lot of knowledge about the world rather than drawing connections and creating resonance. Um, and I think that's a really critical, critical thing for schools that are designing student learning experiences in ways that embed global competence. So here's a video from some students here in Minnesota that worked across a year long period in a project based learning model that we had that allowed them to identify community issues and prototype solutions. Our project is about uh, the use of antibiotics and hormones in meat. We worked on a project called Brain Drain. It's where the educated people of a certain country leave and travel to a developed country. The project I'm doing is on women's rights. I wanted to try something new because I felt like since it's about women's rights, I would just want to have my voice be heard. I decided to write a children's book about bees. Since the bees are kind of endangered and um, they're dying very quickly, I hope that my project will change the way the farmers grow their animals. Maybe I would like make a difference in this world put out my experiences, I'll pull my heart out on this piece of paper. The title of my poem, In Yo Emera, Women's Rights. Fighting our rights for equality until we're accepted by society, but support these women who fought for us. I hope that my project educates kids that about 90% of our food really depends on the bees. And before the project, I wasn't really super into bees. I was like, kind of hesitant because I was like, why are we doing this? Like, it didn't really mean much to me, but now I'm like, oh, this is like really important. Everybody needs to like do something about this. School, it's a lot more interesting now. I found out that if you actually pay attention and investigate more, you can actually learn some very interesting things. But instead of just like saying, oh, it's not my problem, this project made me want to like help more people out and focus on real issues. When you think of world savvy, you think of like the issues that are affected around this world. It kind of got me out of my 
closed mindset, and it made me think about the world as kind of more connected. Global issues seem so far away, but really they're closer to us than we think. After the project, I just feel like I can do more as uh, how I can really help in global problems and how I can educate people about them and how they can help too. Empower young women in schools, organizations, out of tools. We're right to be legal, we are equal. And gender gap, this is a wrap. Um, I, the reason I love that part, the, that video so much is that um, the young woman that you saw in the video um, was from a team that eventually prototyped a board game to help people understand the gender pay gap, and they wanted to charge um, men more than women for the exact rate of the gender pay gap, which I thought um, was hilarious, illegal, um, but hilarious and creative. Um, with respect to educators, the effective principles that we've really um, honed in on when we're working with educators across the country are, are facilitating those kinds of student-led, that kind of student-led inquiry. So not the sage on the stage, but the meddler in the middle um, in a classroom. The ability to leverage real-world case studies and embrace complexity, to establish real routines for this individual exploration and personalized learning, and then to leverage technology throughout the process. The, the other piece that's really important is to find ways to integrate this into formal assessment, into ongoing reflection as well. And so, and to create space and time for that in the classroom. So there's a video, um, time doesn't allow me to show it. It's a five minute video, we'll upload um, after this so you get to see it, of a group of sixth grade teachers who team taught and essentially completely redesigned their grade book to embed um, global competence into it and break down things like collaboration and critical thinking and communication skills um, so that students could see how um, their grade was developed um, through the most important competencies that their teaching was designed to encourage. Um, and finally, we work with a lot of school leaders um, to try to think about how to institutionalize global competence in learning environments and, and how to go about that. And from a practice and routine standpoint, it's this from a very cultural norms standpoint, fostering openness and transparency and dialogue um, within the school community as a whole is really critical. And then making sure that there's time and space for opening up that discourse, not just when um, something bad happens or something challenging happens in, in the school community, but as a default way of interacting. Um, meaningful engagement with parents and the broader community. Um, and then of course, in policies and structures, a range of stakeholder groups are engaged so that not just can they help define and collectively understand what it is you're trying to move forward, but they can be a part of that learning environment. Um, and then having global competence show up in critical strategy and guiding documents, including the budget. The main things that we so this is Amy Fearing, who is a, a principal, now works in the district at Minneapolis Public Schools, who ran a newcomer school that was 99% East African and talking about how she did that. One of the main things that we focused on here is creating and allowing time and space for conversation. Oftentimes, it's the most challenging moments that give us the most impactful results in terms of gaining more global competency or gaining that multiple perspective. It's hard to force on somebody um, when times are good, when times run smoothly, that there's other viewpoints, there's other ways to see things, there's other ways to do things. But when it's confronted to us that our way is maybe is not the right way for that situation or is not the right way in general, that is when we have the moment to pause and think and then develop an action plan on how we move forward. What we have seen here at Wellstone, though, is how do you have the grit and the stamina? How do you have the resiliency and the motivation to get past that misunderstanding? And that's where I think the critical piece of engaging students and staff in understanding themselves first to be able to understand others allows for that conversation. So when we have um, a situation here at Wellstone where you have different perspectives coming in, whether it's cultural, whether it's language, whether it's race, whether it's gender, any of those situations, we pause and we take time as a community to open up that space, to set norms, to set rules, but then to have that space and start hearing where other people are coming from. And that it's not just the outcome of people being able to see it, but it's that process of working through it because that is a skill that our students are going to need, whether they decide to stay in the United States or go, go somewhere else in the world. The last thing I'll share in case folks aren't aware of it is there was a recent study done here in the United States um, called the Canopy Project that looked at um, uh, it essentially what do the most innovative schools have in common um, across the US? And so it's trying to build collective knowledge. Um, 
there were 161 schools, one in five were rural, half were district, a third were charters, and some alternative models. And it's it an incredibly diverse um, database. Um, and so the takeaway here is that innovation really doesn't arise in a limited set of circumstances or only as a luxury for privileged schools, and that it's more than what's new or different. It's really about the application of learning modalities that we've reviewed today in ways that help break through to students and give them um, other opportunities to, to do real world learning. So the, the link is at the bottom of this slide and we can also put it in the chat. It's incredibly interesting. Um, some of the things if you glance across here, you'll see SEL, competency-based education, project-based learning, real world problem solving, um, social justice focus, interdisciplinary, culturally responsive practices. So these are some of the core to the design practices that, again, reinforced what we've seen in the last 21 years inside um, schools that are really doing this well. I want to leave you with the minute we have left with a reminder. Um, in education, and K-12 education particularly, we're so often um, sort of drawn to the, what's the checklist? What's the plan? How do we implement it? And the reality about global competence is that it's dynamic, it's aspirational, and that it's a lifelong journey. And, and that we're never really there. Um, I, I use the term little e expert for a reason, because I think there's so much humility we all need to enter into this work with and to help pass on in the learning frameworks that we provide to young people who think about their own place and space in the world. Um, and what we try to do is work with schools to br really build the capacity to create globally competent learning environments so they can adapt and change um, as the world changes. Um, and just a big thank you to each of you here because educators, um, certainly in the US now, and I, I, I know in other places in the world are not always the most appreciated, lifted up and honored um, for their efforts. But as school and district leaders and educators, you really are the entrepreneurs. You are those that are making this happen. Um, and there's so much power in the three feet of influence that you have. And so I'm just honored to have been able to kick off the GLOW conference with you here this morning. So this is a little bit more about how to find me and World Savvy and to stay abreast with what we're doing. And please, wherever you are in the world, running a school or otherwise, would love to connect with you. And just a huge thank you to Lucy and to Bill and to all the partners at GLOW. Um, it's really an honor to be with you. Dana, thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. And they, I wish you could have seen the, the chat because the messages were so interactive and engaged in everything you were doing and saying. Uh, that hopefully you can go back and look at it later because um, it was fabulous. And as someone who loves global education, you were right on with everything. So thank you so much for being here and your amazing contribution to the conference and to um, your session. So, thank you. Hooray, World Savvy. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank um, you. And our session recordings are going to be available so you can um, see the keynotes right here through this URL and also through the um, QR code that's there. And then later you'll have access to the regular sessions too. But the first ones, it'll take a little bit of time because we're a little busy. But the first ones will be on YouTube uh, for the keynote recordings. Uh, and then please evaluate the sessions. You can you know, share your thoughts on these. So please share your thoughts on the sessions. Here's a QR code and link for that as well. We really want your feedback. Uh, and we're so excited. The first one's gone smoothly. Thank you, Bill and Lucy, for all your hard work for this. Join our community to connect with the global network of educators and learners and all the resources and stay tuned for more exciting um, things today too, because there will be a lot going on throughout the day. So thank you everybody. We're gonna close this one out and stop the broadcast and there'll be another one starting in about eight or nine minutes. So see you soon, thank you.